everyone. My name is Sheila and I am a children and youth services librarian at Vancouver Island Regional Library. And before we get started today, I want to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Indigenous peoples of each of the communities here in our service area and represented by those in attendance at today's virtual program. I am coming to you from the unceded territory of the Stanemo people whose historical relationship with the land continues to this day. So welcome everyone to our Summer Reading Club weekly virtual event. Our very special guest today is Dr. Jay Cullen. And Dr. Cullen is a professor of Earth and Ocean Sciences at the University of Victoria, right here on Vancouver Island. And today, Dr. Cullen is going to talk about his personal experience going through the Canadian Space Agency's astronaut selection program. So that is super exciting. If you have any questions for Dr. Cullen, please put them in the comments section below and we will ask as many as we have time for at the end. So if you want to find out if you have the right stuff to make it into space, put your listening hat on and get ready. Welcome Dr. Cullen. Thanks for that introduction, Sheila. It's, it's really my pleasure to be here uh, with the Summer Reading Club, and I'm really excited about uh, your, your theme for this year, Exp Explore Our Universe. I mean, um, as an oceanographer who, who works to understand how the oceans work on our planet and how they, for example, modulate the climate of our planet, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a theme that really hits home with me. Um, as Sheila indicated, what I'm going to talk to you today about is my experience um, working towards a lifelong goal of becoming an astronaut to, to explore our universe. And while ultimately I haven't yet become an astronaut, we're going to talk about setting goals and working towards those goals. And sometimes there are setbacks uh, along the way. And what I want to talk to you about today is really what I think or consider to be uh, a successful failure when it comes to uh, working towards your dream. And trying to understand our universe and our place in it. So I'm going to share with you uh, a presentation and uh, I'll show you some slides and talk a little bit about this journey that started for me uh, when I was uh, in, in grade school, really thinking about space and wanting to be an explorer. Um, and something, as I said before, I continue to work towards to this day. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about what kinds of skills you need to develop to, to become an astronaut. Uh, to contribute to this effort uh, of our species to understand our planet and, and our universe. Uh, but I want to stress before we get into uh, details is that there are lots of ways to contribute to efforts to exploring our universe. So astronaut is one job, uh, but there are so many jobs, scientists and engineers uh, who help make space exploration possible. So if you're into building robots or programming computers, uh, you don't have to sit in a rocket and go to space to, to contribute to the success uh, of these missions and, and keep that in mind. There's so many different ways to contribute. So um, let's uh, start by talking about who is responsible for our astronauts in Canada and how the selection process actually occurs. So the Canadian Space Agency is in charge of recruiting our astronauts to determine uh, who has the skills and the temperament to go to space and contribute to space exploration. Our first astronauts in Canada weren't recruited until 1983, but since that time, um, we've had a total of 12 astronauts uh, that have been recruited in three different campaigns, three different selection campaigns. Eight of these astronauts have actually gone off planet on space shuttle miss missions and, and also to the International Space Station, um, uh, as well as to the former Soviet Union Space Station. The fourth recruitment campaign that I'm going to talk about uh, began with an advertisement in June 2016. And I was quite excited to see this ad. So this is the post from the Canadian Space Agency that showed up on Twitter on my wife's birthday uh, in, in, in June of 2016. And basically it said, we're looking to recruit two new astronauts. Um, who's interested? Please apply. And so when I saw this, I, I knew this was the time for me. I, I, I wanted to get my application in. I wanted to be one of these next two astronauts. So what are they looking for in an astronaut? What kind of skills do you need to have? Well, paramount among these skills um, uh, is a good sense of judgment, understanding what's right, what's wrong uh, to do in a certain situation, making decisions uh, with, with good information and making the right decision uh, quickly, 
Uh, you need to have integrity. People need to be able to count on you and to trust you. You have to be able to work in teams. Uh, every astronaut has a whole team of individuals uh, with incredible skills supporting their missions, supporting their training. And when you go to space, you go to space with a team um, that you contribute to and whose safety and success is your responsibility. You need to be able to synthesize uh, lots of information uh, and communicate complicated ideas in, in simple language. Science can be complicated, but the goals of exploration need to be clear to everybody uh, in the public who supports the effort. You need to be a talented public speaker. You have to be able to explain what's going on. You have to make people excited about science. Science is important. Science helps us uh, uh, deal with problems that uh, we face every day and provides uh, some of the best solutions that we've found. You have to be very motivated, so you have to be willing to work hard, um, get out there, uh, improve yourself, and, and work to make others around you better. And you have to be resourceful. So sometimes you find yourself in situations where uh, a problem has to be solved with limited resources. Uh, you might be far away from home and isolated, uh, far away from any help, so you have to be able to help yourself. So these are the sorts of qualities and skills that the space agency is looking for when they're looking for new astronauts. Now, the basic requirements, there are certain things you have to be able to do and certain um, skills you have to have already developed before you can be selected um, as an astronaut recruit. Um, in Canada, you need to be a Canadian citizen or uh, living in Canada, or you can be residing a, a abroad. And ideally, you're, you're proficient in both English and French, both of our uh, official languages. So those of you out there studying in, in French immersion or with a strong interest uh, in both of our language, that's a, a, a real bonus for you. Uh, you need to have a bachelor's degree from um, a recognized university uh, in a science or engineering related field, or uh, you can be uh, a doctor of medicine or a doctor of dentistry. Not surprising uh, when you're away from the planet, uh, it's really useful to have people around who can fix a bad tooth or could fix a broken arm or conduct surgery ultimately in space for very long space flights when we head out towards Mars, for example. And you have to be in very good, excellent, in fact, uh, physical condition and overall health. You have to be fit and you have to be healthy. Um, there are certain height and weight requirements. So you can't be too tall and you can't be too short. And mostly this is so you can fit inside the spacesuit. Okay? Um, and you can't be too heavy and you can't be too thin for the same reasons. You have to have 20-20 vision. You'll notice that I'm wearing glasses. My vision isn't quite that good. Uh, so if you don't naturally have it, it has to be correctable with glasses or contacts uh, to 2020 or better in each eye. And you can't be colorblind. Uh, if somebody tells you to press the red button and not the green button, you have to know which one is which. So uh, colorblindness is, is a problem for uh, astronaut selection. You have to have blood pressure that's not too high. Your heart has to be healthy. And you have to be able to hear well. If somebody asks you to do something, you can't be continuing saying, what, what was that? You have to be able to hear quite well. So after that call in June of 2016, about four years ago, um, who actually answered that call? So you had to fill out an online application listing these basic requirements that you met um, and why you thought you were an appropriate selection uh, to become an astronaut. So almost 8,000 people started their applications online. And at the end of the application period, uh, almost 3,800, 3,800 applications uh, were submitted to the CSA from all over Canada. So you can see, Every uh, province uh, and territory is represented here, and also a sizable number of applicants, almost 10% of applicants were living outside of Canada. And I thought that was really interesting. It means that some of our best trained scientists and engineers and doctors uh, are living outside of Canada. Um, perhaps we should think about bringing them back, working in our country, contributing to space exploration here. Anyway, 3,800 people said, yeah, I'd like this job. Um, please look at me carefully and uh, hire me. So what happened next? In August of 2016, uh, we were invited to conduct an online exam for those applications, those applicants who were deemed to meet those basic requirements I just talked about, physical requirements and, and education requirements. Um, there were two tests, um, one to test your reasoning. So how good are, are you at logic and arithmetic, um, analytical reasoning, problem solving, um, number or letter series, so what's your working memory like? Can you recall lots of digits and lots of numbers uh, and repeat those? Uh, basically, how well you're able to, to, to reason. 
And the second part of the test tested your judgment. It gave you sort of situations where you, there were different options of how you could deal with a problem or deal with a situation. Say one of your schoolmates isn't pulling their weight on a, on a class project. How do you deal with that? Do you tell your teacher? Do you talk to your classmate? Different ways of dealing with problems. So being an astronaut requires that you need to be able to uh, work as a team and solve problems and exercise good judgment. So this online test was designed to determine how you behave in these sorts of situations. So after we finished that test, there was a cutoff that one had to meet to continue on in the selection campaign. And after that online exam was written, uh, 1,700 applicants were retained uh, in the recruitment campaign. Um, so uh, you can still see most of those applicants are coming from our large provinces of Ontario and Quebec. There are about 170 of us here in British Columbia uh, who made the cut. Um, and uh, just a few applicants, for example, in the Yukon, one in Nunavut, um, smaller numbers from our smaller provinces like Prince Edward Island, but all across Canada. And for the women, the young women who are uh, perhaps listening today, I want you to notice only about a quarter of those applicants were women. And we need more women applicants uh, to become astronauts. So those of you who are young uh, explorers, young women explorers, uh, take note there. There's too many men in that group. We need more women. So um, the next step in the process was to, uh, to provide a, a written medical history. So basically telling the space agency uh, what your health was like and how it had been in the past. So they wanted to know your medical history and your family's medical history. If there was a history of, for example, uh, health problems that could be uh, disqualifying for being an astronaut in, in your family. So had you ever had any serious accidents or in injuries, like a big car crash, or maybe you had a terrible skiing accident, uh, broke some bones, uh, did you, do you have a family uh, history of genetic or de degenerative diseases? And some of our families ha have those sorts of uh, unfortunate um, um, histories. Uh, and uh, they ask you things like, for example, do you smoke? I shouldn't have to tell you that smoking is bad for you. Uh, none of the candidates that I met through the entire process were smokers, just so you know. Um, so they just wanted to know, what's your health like? Tell us, are you a healthy person? So you fill out that form. And then uh, sometime in uh, uh, November, uh, I received this, this email. And this is the email that would come from the space agency throughout each uh, hurdle that you had to jump uh, through during the process. And every time an email showed up from them in, in your inbox, you were really excited. It's like, uh, what, what's happening? Am I gonna be retained? And if you can read this, it's, it's quite small, but down below you can see, hello, congratulations. We're pleased to announce that your candidacy has been retained. And those are the words that you were looking to read in these emails. So I was quite happy to get this email in November, uh, um, inviting me to the military base at Jericho Beach in Vancouver uh, to have a full medical and full physical uh, so that the doctors could have, have a real careful look at me. And at that point uh, in the process, only 100 candidates were left. So uh, there were six of us in British Columbia um, certain of the smaller provinces and territories no longer had representation. Um, and you can see that there were still 65% men uh, in this 100. Uh, but 100 people were invited to undergo these uh, physicals at military bases. They, they wanted to take some of our blood and urine and poke us and prod us and see how healthy we were um, and put us through our paces a little bit. So I uh, took the ferry over to Jericho uh, Beach and, and uh, again, uh, gave a lot of blood and uh, was poked and prodded in my eyes and my ears checked and, uh, you know, open your mouth and say, ah, um, basically uh, passing a physical that you would have to uh, pass to become a, a commercial or a military uh, pilot. So they just wanted to make sure that you were as healthy as you said you were. So that was in December of 2016. So uh, by that time in December, we were down from about 3,800, 3,800 applications to 72 of the 100 uh, were invited to more rigorous and um, systematic testing uh, that was going to be done, uh, bringing us all together in one spot uh, to compare our skills and to compare our suitability to become astronauts. Um, of those 72, it was really quite interesting. Uh, you can see here, uh, between uh, the 72 candidates who were retained, uh, 210 university degrees were held by those 72 candidates. Um, most of those degrees were in science and engineering and medicine. 
Um, there are a couple of uh, earth and ocean scientists like me, but uh, some test pilots, uh, medical doctors, uh, almost every university in Canada, uh, somebody had taken a degree from uh, a higher degree from the university. So I only have two degrees. I have a bachelor's of science and I have a PhD uh, in chemistry. And so I felt like uh, uh, I wasn't really pulling my weight. Many people there had three, four, some of them had five degrees. Very impressive to meet uh, these people and exciting to be alongside them uh, competing for one of these spots. So I just wanna show you, this is a video and it's going to be narrated by David St. Jacques, uh, who was an astronaut at the time, talking about this first selection process where they brought us to a military base south of Montreal and for about four days or so, they didn't let us sleep very much. Uh, they physically tested us, they mentally stretched us, made us uncomfortable, uh, made us make difficult uh, decisions um, to see how we responded and whether we had the right stuff uh, to become a, a Canadian astronaut. I'll just let this play for a little bit so you get a feeling of the sort of things uh, that they had us doing at the time. Uh, what you can see are, are these 72 candidates that are being brought. Those are the, the group I, I was involved with. And they took us um, and physically exhausted us, uh, uh, put us in the pool, made us swim, hold our breath, uh, do underwater obstacle courses, uh, pepper us with information that we needed to uh, uh, bring back and use uh, perhaps days later, um, physically exhausting us to the point where we wanted to stop and then pushing us a bit further. You'll see me uh, in a little bit here looking pretty winded and, and uh, pretty tired. So physically exhausting you and then giving you very difficult logic problems to solve or um, mathematics, uh, uh, memorization, uh, all the sorts of things that an astronaut needs to be able to do, solving problems when they might be tired, uh, when they might wanna go to sleep, uh, but when their teammates are, are relying on them uh, to, to keep them safe um, and for everyone to be is successful. So uh, that was in uh, January of, uh, of 2017. Uh, they put us through our paces. Uh, it was one of the most difficult things I've ever done. I've, I've run marathons, I've, I've climbed mountains, uh, but uh, I really felt like I'd been put through the ringer uh, in uh, early 2017. The Canadian Space Agency really knows how to determine uh, how you'll behave under pressure um, and really what you're capable of. So um, after that first selection, uh, we went from uh, 72 candidates uh, down to 32. And in April of 2017, that pool of talented applicants uh, was whittled down uh, to just uh, 17. And you'll note, if you look very carefully, if you compare my face with the faces that are in this particular picture, um, I did not make it to the final 17 candidates. So my journey towards uh, becoming an astronaut ended uh, but uh, seeing these individuals and meeting and seeing what they were capable of, um, any one of these 17 candidates would have been uh, a fantastic astronaut. Um, but the Canadian Space Agency could only select two. Um, and among this group, uh, you'll see uh, in, in the back in the middle is Jeremy Hansen, who was uh, one of our active astronauts at the time. Um, and these 17 candidates being presented uh, to the public and, and to the press um, as they headed into the, the final selection process. So before I go on, um, uh, all of the selection process was really geared around um, making sure that those qualities that I emphasized at the beginning that the space agency was looking for, that these candidates and the final two that would be selected um, had what it took to perform under pressure, uh, to make very good decisions and had the skills that the space agency was looking for uh, to contribute to space exploration. So to con contribute to the international effort to explore our universe. And on July 1st, a few years ago um, in 2017, at the Canada Day celebration in Ottawa, um, the two who were selected were first uh, introduced to the public um, uh, uh, on the front lawn of, of parliament in Ottawa. And those two uh, astronauts, our, our newest astronauts, uh, uh, a test pilot with the Canadian military, um, uh, Joshua Kutrick, and an engineering doctor uh, who studies combustion, so how you burn things, uh, who was at uh, Cambridge University uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, Dr. Jenny Seide Gibbons. 
So I was really excited to see them appear on the stage. Everything was secret, so we didn't know who had actually been selected. Only the two that were selected knew. And when they walked out on stage, I don't think any of the, the candidates who made it uh, deep into the competition uh, were surprised necessarily. Um, and nobody uh, uh, really could have been prouder uh, that these two individuals had been selected. So uh, it was a really exciting uh, day to watch uh, Jenny and, and Josh be introduced and move almost immediately in August of that year and into September uh, down to Houston to the Johnson Space Center where the Canadian astronauts train alongside uh, their, their, their NASA partners. So they joined Jeremy Hansen and David St. Jacques who recently um, in the last couple of years returned from uh, an extensive mission uh, to the International Space Station. So David was our last Canadian in space and fingers crossed, very soon, uh, Jeremy will be assigned a mission and we'll be able to see him uh, um, uh, climb aboard a rocket and visit the International Space Station. Um, what's quite exciting going forward, many of you who are interested in space exploration have probably been following that SpaceX and the Crew Dragon mission that recently uh, took off uh, from uh, Florida, one of the first crewed space missions uh, from North America uh, in, in, in over 10 years. Uh, to fly to the International Space Station. Um, Canada and the US are partnering uh, to extend missions and return to the moon um, in the next decade, perhaps, which is incredibly exciting, meaning that um, of our four Canadian astronauts who are active now, we may actually see them uh, flying to the moon uh, in the near future, which um, I personally, I can't wait for. So while I'm at home and working on the ocean and uh, I'm not going to be Canada's ex, uh, next uh, astronaut. I'm still incredibly excited living vicariously through Jenny and Josh and, and following their training and, and waiting uh, for the day when they're named to a crewed mission uh, and will fly to space. And it's, it's all really exciting. Um, knowing uh, Jenny and Josh, um, I have been able to uh, go down uh, to Houston and visit Johnson Space Center. Those of you who watch um, uh, space movies uh, like Apollo 13 will recognize this room. Uh, this is Mission Control um, in the craft building at Johnson Space Center. So I got to have a little tour and, and see where all of those Apollo missions and, and the Gemini missions, those crewed missions took off from the United States and were controlled uh, um, uh, back in the, uh, the 60s and, and the 1970s, which is quite a long time ago now. Um, I was able to uh, visit the space uh, vehicle mock-up facility, which is basically a huge room where they have uh, scale models of the International Space Station and all the spacecraft that uh, the astronauts fly on so that they can train and familiarize, uh, familiarize themselves with that, that, that equipment. This is me on the lower left uh, at the business end of a Saturn V rocket, which you can see in Lego form here beside me. Um, it's really, uh, staggering how large these rockets were. These were the rockets that took uh, the Americans to the moon in the, in the 60s and the 70s, uh, 30 stories high, uh, 6 million pounds. It's a lot of rocket and pretty impressive to see uh, firsthand. And on the right there, you can see the Apollo 17 command module that actually uh, went uh, to the moon and orbit around the moon and returned to earth. Um, that's at the, the museum there at Johnson Space Center. So while um, uh, I won't be uh, an astronaut, uh, it's, it's unlikely that I will be. Um, the, the whole process taught me a lot about myself, um, what I'm capable of, uh, where I could improve myself. Um, and uh, I've continued to try to improve myself, uh, to develop new skills. Uh, one exciting thing that I've been working on um, is uh, becoming a, a private pilot. So working on my private pilot license. And on the left there is my friend and colleague and instructor, uh, Jeff Steves, who's a physicist at, at the University of Victoria and who also in 2008 uh, was one uh, of the last uh, 17 uh, astronaut candidates in, in, in the uh, selection process. Uh, unfortunately, he wasn't selected to be an astronaut, but I got to know him as I was working through this process. And now he teaches me to fly airplanes, uh, which is really exciting. Um, uh, and uh, he's been a really good friend through, throughout the process uh, and continues to be. And uh, while I was disappointed not to be selected um, to become an astronaut, um, on the one hand, I, I get to spend more time with my family. If I was training to go on a space mission right now, I'd be living in Houston. 
um, my family would be, I wouldn't see them as much uh, as I do now. And uh, I get to spend lots of time with them. I, I get to go uh, take my, my son to the center of the universe, uh, the observatory uh, uh, in front of uh, the cutout of, of Chris Hadfield there. You can see us building this rocket that I have beside me. And so uh, I encourage them to pursue their goals and pursue their dreams when it comes to uh, exploring our universe. And finally, as I said before, um, I just keep tabs on, on what Josh and, and Jenny and uh, what they're up to, how their training's going. Uh, just like you, they've been going through quarantine, uh, not going into the office, but continuing to, to work from home. So uh, how do you control the, the, the Canada Arm 2 uh, from your computer at home? Uh, Josh was uh, in the, the command uh, control center during the SpaceX crewed flight. Um, it's really exciting to see them on TV, see them working towards uh, their dream of, of going to space. And uh, I'll be excited to see what they do in the future. So um, that's just a, a, a little story about, about what happened to me. Um, I, I hope it's been interesting. I'm really happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, and if I can't answer them, I'll get you the, the best answers that I can and, and uh, send them along. Um, if you want to get in contact with me at the University of Victoria, I'm pretty easy to find my email is just uh, jcullen at, at uh, uvic.ca. And if you use Twitter or you have friends who use Twitter, um, I tweet about science, I tweet about exploration, um, and I tweet about nonsense sometimes too. Uh, you can find me there. So um, if you don't have time or uh, you think of a question later on that you'd like answered, um, I'll answer it uh, or I can send it to somebody who can get the best answer for you. So I'm happy to um, take your questions and, and thanks for listening. All right, Dr. Colin, we do have some questions here for you. Let's get this one out of the way that several people want to know, and that is how do you go to the bathroom in space? Going to the bathroom in space has a long, long history. Um, so ever since uh, people started uh, heading up in rockets, whether waiting on the launch pad through long delays uh, or uh, ultimately living for up to a year or more on the International Space Station, that problem of going to the bathroom is one that you can't get away from, even if you go into outer space. And so it started simply as sometimes wearing a diaper um, for short missions where you weren't uh, away from Earth too long. So during Mercury and, and Gemini missions in the 60s, uh, sometimes the astronauts just had to go in their suits. Um, but uh, later on, uh, those of you who've done backcountry camping or mountaineering, uh, the state of the art was uh, going in a bag. Uh, and then, uh, getting rid of that afterwards. Uh, today on the International Space Station, there's actually a, a pretty uh, important piece of technology that uses uh, a vacuum and a funnel. And uh, what it does is it uh, takes away uh, both bits of business and bags them up. And then uh, periodically, uh, that uh, waste is loaded onto a spacecraft that uh, a cargo um, a holder that is just jettisoned from the International Space Station and uh, falls into the Earth atmosphere and it burns up in the atmosphere. So uh, if you're lucky, on a very clear night, you might look up and see a shooting star that's not really a meteorite, but could be special gifts from astronauts living on the International Space Station. And that's the way it works up there now. Wow, I have obviously not been keeping up myself because I did not know that. Um, so Benji, would like to know what is your favorite star? What's my favorite star? That's a really great question, Benji. Um, this is going to sound a little boring, uh, but I think it's uh, because I'm, I'm pretty Earth-centric. I think our sun is a pretty fantastic star. Now, if you talk to astronomers uh, who study such things, they'll say our star, the sun, is, is just kind of an average middle-aged star. Uh, but you know what? Um, the photons that come from the sun, and travel across space, it takes about eight minutes for those photons to get here. Um, without that star, that star in particular, we wouldn't be here. And uh, those photons, that light allows all the plants uh, to grow that we eat um, and that keep alive all the animals and all the friends and family that we've got on the planet. So uh, it's close. Um, it's not no necessarily a friend to the skin um, uh, sometimes, but uh, it's a pretty fantastic star. So uh, I have to go with, uh, uh, our local hero, uh, the sun. 
Super. And Abby would like to know what inspired you to try to be an astronaut. Abby, that's a great question too. Um, ever since I can remember, um, I've been fascinated by looking up at the night sky. So uh, we're pretty lucky here on Vancouver Island that most places that you can live, uh, you can find spots where you can look up and you can still see the, the stars shining down through. Um, and I remember looking up and seeing uh, satellites that were uh, moving across the sky at night. And if you looked really carefully, you could pick them out and those stars would move across. And uh, I would think, well, how did they get up there? Like, how, how, do they, how do you build a rocket that can take something like that to space? And uh, I wasn't alive when the Apollo uh, missions were going on, but I learned about them when I was quite young. I, I still think it's amazing that people went to the moon and, and walked around on the moon and brought rocks back that taught us about where the moon came from and how it relates to the Earth. So. It was mostly reading and, and being interested in science and, and just wanting to explore that, that, that inspired me. All right, um, so many good questions here. Um, Shane and Levi would like to know what your favorite space food is. Favorite space food. Oh, so um, space food, that's one of the things that has improved a lot. Um, uh, one of the things that David St. Jacques uh, was talking about before he went on his mission is they were making menus for him in different dishes to, to taste test to bring up there. Um, one of the most common space foods that you'll find is dehydrated ice cream. I'm sure some of you have probably come across that in packets and maybe had it given to you uh, uh, for a holiday or birthday or something. Uh, it's normally pretty disappointing, uh, I find. Um, but uh, I really like watching the astronauts make, uh, make pizzas in space when they're, they can spin them and throw them around in the space station. I think that's pretty funny. Wow, now I, I wish you had a video of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, how, they would also like to know how you keep a spaceship clean. Oh, um, yeah, you can imagine that uh, at least if you make a mess here on Earth, uh, it normally ends up on the ground. So uh, if you spill your milk, uh, it might uh, spread out, but it's all more or less in one spot. If you were to do the same thing on the space station, uh, it could really cause a problem. So you'll, you'll see the, the astronauts, for example, um, a lot of, of what they do in the space station is to keep it clean and to keep it running the way it should. Um, one of the interesting things that you can, you can find is that uh, when uh, people, astronauts, are, are cutting their hair or, or shaving, for example, they normally have... Uh, uh, those shears hooked up to a vacuum so that the little bits of hair that normally end up in your collar and scratching you for the rest of the day or in your ears just float off in all directions. Uh, but they have a vacuum that as they cut, sucks everything and keeps it clean. So uh, there's a lot of uh, effectively dusting and vacuuming to keep things tidy and clean. All right. Um, Jade would like to know what your favorite part of the training was. Oh, Jade. Um, so uh, the training itself, uh, when they were, were <laughs> uh, the, the things I enjoyed the most were the things probably I was best at. Um, and uh, as, a, as a professor, you know, you take a lot of tests and you, uh, you have to uh, write a lot of exams. And so those didn't bother me too much. And I kind of liked uh, uh, writing those. Um, uh, I found uh, some of the work in the pool really interesting. They, they put uh, candidates in the pool. You have to be a really good swimmer because when you start training for things like spacewalks or um, splashdowns, when a capsule comes back from outer space and, and splashes down an ocean, you have to be comfortable in the water. Um, and when they do spacewalk training, they do it in this giant pool uh, down at Johnson Space Center in, in Houston. So you have to be comfortable in the water. And some of the pool exercises were quite challenging. Um, doing puzzles underneath the water on a single breath, uh, um, gathering clues to, to solve problems later. Uh, it was pretty uh, challenging, but fun too. Okay, another question from Benji. This is a good one. What future space project are you most excited about? So um, I, I think uh, two uh, I, I, I can mention. Uh, I think the Webb telescope, one of the next uh, telescopes that we're going to put into orbit around the planet. So you've probably heard of the Hubble telescope. And we've learned so much about uh, the universe by having this telescope that doesn't have to try and see through our own atmosphere uh, to look into outer space, into deep space. The Webb telescope is to go up soon. Um, 
Uh, also, the, the, the Martian, the new Mars uh, rover um, uh, is, is to launch uh, relatively soon. Um, but uh, the whole idea of sending people uh, back to the moon, um, perhaps even having a station in orbit around the moon, it's incredibly exciting. It seems like uh, perhaps almost uh, uh, fiction, uh, but people are working towards it right now. How are we going to do that? Who's going to go? All of those are exciting things to think about. All right, and speaking of the rover, just to let the kids out there know, um, NASA does plan on having that as a live link on their live page, and we're planning to link it to our summer reading club page. Don't so you, miss that. Yeah. yeah. And, um, oh, Shane and Levi again, can you do art in space? You do art. You can do art anywhere. And the world needs art, um, and outer space needs art. So um, I, you know, a lot, one interesting fact about um, the astronauts who came back from the moon, um, uh, those astronauts who in the 60s and 70s did travel to the moon and back, uh, a number of them uh, did take uh, to, to painting and, and drawing uh, about their experiences. So it's pretty clear that once people go uh, and leave our planet and spend any time in outer space, their perspective about it, what, what it means to be from Earth, to be an Earthling, uh, changes and uh, a lot of them turn to creative outlets to try and express what that means to them. So whether it's photography, um, almost every astronaut goes to uh, the space station, uh, sends back wonderful photos of, of, of the Earth. Uh, I've seen some beautiful photos of, of the comet um, that's uh, visible in the evening sky and soon in the morning sky, uh, sorry, morning sky and soon in the evening sky. Uh, they're always snapping photographs. but. Uh, yeah, the astronauts tend to be both skilled technically, but they tend to be uh, also very creative, uh, creative minds. So of course you can. Perfect. And it looks like, unless some more questions come in suddenly, I've got one question left that inquiring minds want to know. And that is, if you believe in aliens. Oh, Ooh, that's an interesting question. So um, I think one of the things I spend a lot of time thinking about is what probability there is that uh, life, um, and probably not life that looks like an alien that you might think or that you might see in the movies, but uh, life um, in, in a way that's similar to what we have on, on Earth here is, is found anywhere else in our solar system or, or, or elsewhere in the universe. That's one of the big questions that, that scientists are working on. And a lot of people that I work with who work to understand how microbes, so bacteria and virus uh, that live in the ocean, how they make their livings and how they're able to live in uh, extreme environments. So at the bottom of the ocean where the pressure would crush uh, you know, a, a car into a, a tiny can uh, and where the temperatures might be uh, well above the boiling uh, point of water, uh, how they're able to do that. And the fact that they can do it here suggests that it, it's probable that they could do it elsewhere. And so what I'm most interested in is, are the efforts to see if, if life has existed on, on other planets or moons in our solar system. Um, and eventually I'm sure those questions will start to be asked about all the planets that uh, we're discovering um, outside of our solar system. So that's what I'm particularly excited about. Although I do love reading science fiction and I love watching movies about aliens. So I guess that was the second to last question because Clara has sent us a question to sneak in right here at the end. Clara wants to know if you have heard about the elevator to the space station and if you know when it will open. Ooh. So that's an interesting technology. Actually, um, uh, in, in books that I've, I've been reading recently, there's a lot of, of speculation about what a space elevator would look like. Um, if you've got really strong light materials, you can actually, uh, you know, build a, a what, what, what is effectively a rope um, with a, a point that's in orbit around the planet. And then to get to outer space, you don't have to hop in a rocket. You can just crawl up the rope with some uh, other form of, of, of engine, uh, other sort of machine. Um, I don't know how far off that technology is. I'd have to ask one of my engineering friends, but wouldn't it be great to be able to uh, go and press that button and, and head up? It's pretty exciting. Absolutely. So it looks like that is all we have for you today. And um, thank you so much to all the kids who asked questions. And thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Cullen, because that was fantastic.
please everyone out there, let Dr. Colin know how much you enjoyed his talk by commenting down below here and telling him thank you. And we have lots more Summer Reading Club fun still to come this summer. For the complete lineup of our guests, please head to the kids page at virl.bc.ca and follow the link to find out about all the fabulous things we have scheduled. And you will also find there a link to join our Facebook Summer Reading Club group. And while you're on our website, please like us on Facebook and Instagram, follow us on Twitter and sign up for our newsletter. And thank you again for coming. And hopefully we will see you again here next week when our special guest will be author Monique Gray Smith. And she will be doing a live reading from some of her amazing books. And she is such a wonderful speaker. You do not want to miss that. Thank you. Thank you.